life, I have five daughters. Um, so I was always struggling with the proper role of a father. And growing up through, I would say the 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of, you know, hardcore feminist, like messaging out there about the demasculinization of basically society and <laughs> toxic masculinity started to be a, a buzzword. And I didn't really know what to explain to my daughters about the proper role of being a female was or my role as a father to them. So I, I did a lot of introspection. And one of the things that I came across just randomly in my normal readings was uh, Calhoun's experiments. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the mice experiments that Calhoun did in the 60s and 70s. But the parallels between kind of some of the things that happen with the mice and what you kind of see happening in society struck me as really um, hard to explain. And uh, not to dive too deep in that, but that kind of started my journey. And I went through and uh, found uh, Nietzsche, primarily a lot of Jung. Um, and then my background as a data scientist kind of all blended together to kind of view the entirety of the system of society through the lens of evolution. And that's when I guess epiphanies happened and I decided to start putting some, some ideas out there that connections were made. So, yeah, I think a lot of people have come to this kind of area of intellectual interest through some kind of avenue from evolutionary psychology or biology. Mm -hmm. For people not familiar with it, could you just give us a, a brief insight into what struck you about the my studies and also perhaps address the idea that we are somehow radically different from other mammals and you can't extrapolate from my studies to human beings? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the, the, probably the best paper to read is called death squared. It was a, I forget what magazine it was published in, but you can Google that. And it was one of Calhoun's publications. Um, and he basically did a fourfold experiment, four phase experiment with mice. He put them in a utopia. Um, and he, he repeated it with both mice and rats with this, pretty much the same outcome. And in the utopia, they were given unlimited food, unlimited water, enough, um, housing space for like 3000 residents or something like that. And he kind of just let society, the rat society or mouse society play out. And uh, what he noticed happened uh, was the predicted exponential growth curve on the front end, but then it plateaued long before the housing was, was taken up and the eventual extinction of the society itself. Reproduction ceased, um, maternal abortion of their own young intro, and then also uh, infanticide and, and brood abandonment were witnessed. High rates of autism like behavior in the male's mice, he coined them the beautiful ones, they withdrew from society and kind of just groomed themselves all day, didn't engage in dominance disputes or anything like that. Um, and uh, it eventually led to complete societal collapse and extinction to where there were no new pups born. And um, so you look at that whole setup, and you kind of think about our birth rates, uh, mm -hmm. the gender role swapping, there was he saw increased aggression in the female mice. And a lot of the things just kind of lined up and it's not really um, a one-to-one -one comparison because, you know, we don't necessarily have a density problem like they did. You know, one of the things he drew out was that you have to have the ability to immigrate EM, right? Ability for, you know, new mice to take up and, and create a hierarchy. And one of the things that I struggled to figure out was we don't really have that problem, at least not yet. And yet we're kind of seeing the same issues develop. And what struck me was I had a, the connection that I made was that it was the collapse of the hierarchy itself. So even though the proximate cause of what killed the hierarchy may be different from us to them, mm -hmm. the collapse of the hierarchy has the same symptoms, just like liver failure always leads to jaundice, right? Something like that. So that's kind of what I determined is, is I think is going on is that the hierarchy in our society is actually collapsing. And from that, you kind of ask, well, what's a hierarchy and what is it? What is its purpose? And, to determine that I had to go all the way back and start studying evolution from really a single cell on up. And that's kind of where we, we led through there. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea of the collapse of hierarchy to people of a certain uh, philosophical or political persuasion sounds great because hierarchies mean oppression, don't they? Yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's funny because uh, one of the, the big linkages that helped me was all of Jordan Peterson's lecture, lectures, specifically in his biblical lecture series. 
um, he really made the case that the, the male hierarchy specifically has a, an evolutionary function and we, we codify kind of the rules of it um, within religion and, and somewhat also within um, in the economic you know, interactions mm -hmm. that we have. And as soon as you kind of make that connection, it's like, all right, well, if hierarchy has a function evolutionarily, well, so does almost everything else we do. So that would imply marriage has a function evolutionarily, that all of the maternal instincts and uh, nurture that females display have evolutionary functions, and then trying to figure out what those are and why they're all seem to be failing now, kind of is where I started. And it led me to, to the birth control pill as the kind of the, the pivot point, um, and specifically hormonal contraception. I think there's a, a broader conversation about contraception in general that, that could be had, but I don't think it's as powerful as hormonal contraceptive as a specific talking point. Um, mm -hmm. there's just so much ancillary evidence that it impacts the lowest level of our society, the, the, the interactions between the nodes. And it just has a, such a major foundational impact there. And the timing lines up too, um, with a lot of the different shifts we've seen in, in divorce rates in satisfaction among the females specifically. Um, it's, it's, it's quite compelling. Well, let's get into that in a bit more detail then. If you just take us through what you see as some of the significant implications of hormonal contraception, starting on the individual level, because it, it's probably true to say that society is just the, the sum of individual interactions. If you, mm -hmm. if you see it as something that's real in itself, you're making the mistake of um, reifying an abstraction. So all Correct, we really yeah. are is just individuals interacting. We take a, say, 13, 14-year-old girl now, and she goes on to hormonal contraceptives. What do you see as some of the, the biggest implications of that? Personally, I think it's probably too early to tell. We don't fully understand what we're doing. But Yeah, we don't know. But I, I would say the my biggest concern about the whole situation is that it actually impacts female mate selection preference. And that in its core, if you think about, um, so I, I guess we need to rewind a little bit. So the reason that the male hierarchy is able to function as an evolutionary mechanism is twofold. In, in a simple species, the, the dominant males can just keep lower males out of the area of breeding, whatever that happens to be, right? And so that just by being the only male in the vicinity, they gain reproductive rights. But in a lot of species, birds um, and some more advanced, like, for us, for instance, females actually have a choice who they mate with. And so the male hierarchy and female mate selection preference are interconnected. So that, that as long as the females are choosing from the top of the male hierarchy for mating purposes, they work together to kind of uh, act in an evolutionary manner to pick the best genes and rise them to the top mm. and, and um, push that genetic material forward, increasing fitness down the line. And I don't know how deep you want to get on the fitness score and um, and those kind of like technical optimization style problem that, that it's really solving. But if you aren't selecting that way, overall, fitness is not going to trend the correct direction. And you're going to have problems in your species to maintaining genetic health. Yeah. What the, the Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I, I think it's it would be accurate to say that the, the, the function of the male is a a genetic filter broadly, given that the female is the limiting factor in reproduction, you have yeah, to have right. more selection on the male side. And that actually gives the females a kind of power because they're the limiting factor. They get to choose. Right. So there's an interplay in the optim. So let's rewind a little bit. The optimization problem of life is, is trying to solve what's called the universal fitness function. Right. And basically that is what thing can, reproduce and continue to reproduce stably the best over the long run right mm -hmm. and that's kind of the problem the issue is that that the fitness function is constantly changing it's dynamic with time right the environment shifts the earth is not the same composition as it was you know a billion years ago and so what it ends up selecting for is is really adaptability um one of the things that that life has asexual life early life had only one mechanism by which to deal with that shifting environment and that was random mutation at the gene level so asexual species has to mutate its genetic code to be able to adapt and create you know a, a varying 
set of offspring so they can deal with the potential changes in the environment or in the predation patterns or other species competition, you know, all of it plays. What the issue is that you vary too much, most genetic mutations are negative. They're detrimental to the species. And so what is happening is if you vary too much, too many of your offspring are not viable to continue to reproduce, so you lose out. What sexual selection or sexual reproduction allowed us to do as, as a set of life is we can vary the male side more. So we, we carve out 50% of our species roughly say, all right, you're not, we don't need all of you to survive. We can vary you much more and then take from the top of what comes back and reintegrate that in and thereby keeping the female core of the species viable at all costs mm. while allowing a large portion of the male species to be unviable and that not be an issue as far as birth rates go. So the males become some sort of a genetic test bed yeah. kind of right now. Um, and that's and so from that you naturally get hypergamy and polygamy. Those are the two mating strategies that that come out. The females are going to choose the best male. That's hypergamy, and the males are going to choose no one. They're going to pick whatever whoever will take them, which is polygamy, right? Yeah. Um, in our society, obviously we've we've done something different, and and I think that it's important to note that that monogamy, at least societal monogamy, is foundational for civilization. Um, and, and it goes back to a couple of things that we talked about, the incel problem, uh, yeah. you know, and the ability to cooperate. Um, but the original fitness function, all of that optimization was done on the personal level. So what we've been talking about up to this point is really optimizing a single individual's fitness, right? There's, a, there's another term in the overall fitness of a species that you can add, and it's called the inclusive fitness term. So um, my brother, for instance, his him having children actually he has a lot of my genes therefore if i help him to have children or help his children to survive i get an inclusive fitness bump for those genes that contribute to that right yeah. and that's how you see species like ants and other really eusocial species come about is that, that they focus primarily on that inclusive side we've been making that shift but back to the pill the uh, the pill shifting female mate selection preference and i'm not from, sure if you're familiar with these studies but um the the female mate selection preference varies throughout the menstrual cycle so during uh, during and right before ovulation she prefers mostly masculine features uh, you know depth of voice jawline um build height etc and then during the toxically masculine gonna... dominant behavior yeah yeah right yeah. where she's peak fertility right yeah and when she's uh I forget what the i'm not remembering the phases of the menstrual cycle now but the the phase right before menstruation um she prefers the opposite more feminine features and then through menstruation as well yeah so um the idea behind that is that um she's looking for the best dominant genes from the top yeah. of the male hierarchy when she's actually fertile because of the cost of how much energy and effort it takes to raise a child right she wants to maximize the payoff for that well what the pill does it flatlines that whole thing. There's no longer a spike and uh, there's no longer an increased uh, appreciation of masculinity mm. during at least portion of her monthly cycle. If you think about the average over all females, over all society, it's a net shift towards a preferring of feminization of the male counterpart, mm. which is just, I mean, it may seem small on the individual level, and it is, it's, it's probably quite slight on the individual level, but when you aggregate all of those minor interactions from day to day, right, that happen between males and females, it becomes a massive shift for the society. And um, so from my own personal perspective, uh, you know, I've, my girls, I, I worry that anytime you have a biologically optimized system that's meant to select the best possible genetic code for you to breed with, for you to mate with, right? Like, and you modify that, especially 13 to 15 years old, you're changing the course of their entire life in ways that you can't predict. Mm. Like their, their, their boyfriend selection, their entire um, worldview about the proper roles between them and their you know, future husband, everything is is tonally shift and again it might be minor but it's there and if you aggregate that over time i don't think we know how much we've changed the outcomes across our society it yeah, scares I, me we, we we know it's going to be huge already i think but we don't know just how huge yet i think we're playing with something we don't really understand 
And the way you've explained it there, I think that it's clear that the, the pill is altering not only women, but indirectly men too, because where the sexes differ, it's as a result of sexual rather than natural selection. So the pill is actually changing the kind of men that women choose. Could yeah. you go into that in a bit more detail? Yeah. So, well, if you think about what, what a male really is intended to do, he's, his entire purpose is to prove himself worthy for mating, right? And that's at a yes. deep, deep level. Um, and if you think about, if you took the aggregate of female mate selection preference across the fertile group of females in our society, so like you're talking 14 to maybe early 30s is what's really going to be important. And you shift all of them to a little more feminine in their preference, just a little bit. What's going to end up happening from the males is, you know, they, they're a trial and error machine. I remember being young. You approach a girl, you get rejected. What do you do? What did I do wrong? You re you reevaluate, you change your look, you change your approach mechanism, you change something about how you're going. That all happens naturally. Mm -hmm. So if everything shifted a little more feminized towards preference, that means male behavior is going to shift a little more feminized in approach. And I, I think that it, everything, you know, everything's a bell curve, obviously, but I think you see the results of that is the feminization of men started about the same time the pill became prevalent. And I think it's a response of the male hierarchy to female mate selection preference being shifted mm -hmm. specifically in those age groups of them. You know, the people who are most likely to take the pill are the most fertile, which are going to be the most sought after. Yeah. Another note, which I think you brought up on your, your matriarchy video, which I think is probably the most brilliant study that I've seen on this is the stripper um, study of, of ec the economic impact of the pill on strippers tips. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, I, I just, I love that study. I, I read through it the first time and I was like, man, whoever came up with that is just brilliant, like as an idea, because it's so simple and it's easily measurable. And you just look at the data and you're like, all right, well, uh, normal tips of an exotic dancer peak during peak fertility. That's normal. They have a normal up and down in their tip cycle. Anyone on the pill, flatlined and always below. What does that imply? Human female fertility is not fully masked and males can yeah. pick up on it. So not only have you shifted female mate selection preference, but you've dis, you've disjointed the attraction of the female. You've actually lowered the attraction of the female to the from the male's perspective. So they're less attracted on average to chemically sterilized females. Yeah, interesting. So what we've got is the pill is making it so that across the whole of the menstrual cycle, women are less attracted to masculine men, and they certainly don't experience that peak in attraction to masculinity that you get just around ovulation and also men are less attracted overall to hormonally sterilized women so the, the, the glue the bond between the two sexes which is the the evolutionary basis of the family as well the, the locus of the family that is being weakened by this yeah yeah 100 percent i um it's it, when you just step back and think about it. I mean, no judgment. Just think about what we're doing. It's it's wildly unethical experiment. We have no idea what we're doing, and it's all based on basically um, the idea that we should subordinate the reproductive systems purely under the intellectual whims of the individual. And I don't think that that is necessarily a good idea. Um, which kind of goes back to. The, the broader conversation about contraception in general, mm. you know, there's one of it's one of those ideas that any of your lower evolved systems should only be subordinated to your intellect when it's done through discipline, because through that path, you actually gain the wisdom necessary to guide those by developing the discipline for it, right? Mm. Otherwise, if you're just doing it with the intellect, the intellect's dumb. I mean, it, it can never really um, match up against an, a 3.5 billion year evolved optimized system. It's never going to beat that. I just, I, I, I pull back from that as an idea. So yeah, there's a, I think uh, Cardinal Newman had a nice quip that uh, trying to control the, the passions of man with some kind of intellectual, intellectual system. It's like trying to leash an ogre with a noodle. Yep. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, and so I guess what I would say is that there, there are broad ramifications for the breakdown of sexual fidelity, of marriage, and of female mate selection preference, and the integration of the male hierarchy with female constituents. Mm -hmm. those, those four things are, I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen necessarily, but I know that um, it, it's, it's a massive shift. That we've undertaken it's of the same level it's it's even more massive than the original um i guess you'd say the invention of societal monogamy the original civilization creating invention so mm. i uh it's a little scary and, and there's only really one inevitable logical step to go down this path and that's something similar to the other eusocial species out there like ants and and termites and whatnot. We're going to have to have centralized breeding vessels. I, otherwise, we're not going to keep our numbers up. I don't know how else to do it. So, and that's not really a future I want. So, mm. well, you, you can see that in uh, some recent films, like in Fury Road, the Mad Max one, when they have just the breeders who are yep. kept in the little citadel in the middle. And that connects to another implication of contraception broadly but maybe the pill specifically which is encouraging the majority of women to become very similar to men in being a kind of worker <laughs> class uh, could you develop that in terms of you social species and what do you mean by you social species yeah sure so um one of the most interesting civilizational style of species out there that are somewhat comparable to what we have are like the ants and the termites and those are broadly categorized as you social species um, the, the most interesting of that set happens to be the naked mole rat, which if you haven't looked into it, it's actually a mammalian species that's completely eusocial. And what eusociality really implies is a high degree of cooperation amongst the constituent elements. If you think about humanity in that context, we are quasi eusocial. The only part of our society that's not fully eusocial is our reproductive system specifically. The kind of the hallmark of eusociality is a centralized reproductive system in a single ant or maybe a couple queens, right? Uh, bees are the same way. Uh, the, the mole rat has one female who reproduces with big litters and she'll have like three, we'll say alpha males that she breeds with in, in cycles. But the rest of the workers, females and males in, in the rats are all sterile and they're sterilized via the secretion. And this is true for the... Uh, for some ant species as, or for some other eusocial species as well, other than just the naked mole rat, is that the female actually uh, hormonally re, uh, suppresses the reproductivity of the drones, not the drones, I'm sorry, the workers. And the linkage to the supply chain distributing hormonally suppressing uh, reproductive uh, agents to our females uh, is striking on, on the surface. But what you end up doing with that is you force the individual over time of that species to focus solely on the inclusive fitness score that they can boost. In ants, for instance, 70%, 75% of the genetic code of uh, each worker comes from the queen herself. So that means that if the worker ants, which are all female, help the queen to rear more young, 75% of the genetic code makes it on into the future. And only 25% delta is from the male drones that come in, right? Um, so by, by suppressing the reproductive nature of the individual, you can shift the focus from a fitness function perspective to the inclusive side. And that ends up leading to a lot more cooperation and, and mutual young rearing, um, mutual defense, et cetera, those kind of things that happen naturally. Well, we did that too. We did it through monogamy it was our original attempt at reproductive suppression. And that's how we got away from the hypergamy polygamist framework to a more say cooperative male hierarchy, right? It, it allowed yeah. the male hierarchy to be more cooperative, less comp competitive, like our chimp relatives. And now we're, we're in the place where, you know, because the sexual marketplace is somewhat uh, demonopolized, there's less pressure on the males and we can cooperate more in mutual defense and provision. And yeah. You mentioned chimps. This also makes society less violent because without monogamy, there's just, too much incentive for middle or lower ranking males to basically rape, rob, pillage to try and get what they want because otherwise yeah. it's just a couple of the alpha males right at the top who've got everything. 
Exactly. So you really have two choices if you want your, your, your constituent elements to cooperate. You either need to ensure all of their reproductive success or the majority of their reproductive success yeah. across the, the big part of the society, or you have to hormonally suppress them to where they, they won't be able to reproduce and they can focus their efforts on the reproductive elements offspring. So those are the two paths. Um, we chose the first first, obviously, that was our first step out. And the consequence of that was that the males stuck around longer, they provided protection and, and provision itself for the female and infant that allowed the infant's brain to grow bigger and be more dependent, uh, right on the female, she could, mm. you know, eat with having her hands full, still, she didn't have to worry about as much. Um, and it's the self you know, you, you basically, we found a place in the fitness function to land on a stable pattern that had a nice upslope that we were able to walk really quickly to a good plateau. Now, the question is, is hormonal contraceptive just another step in our evolutionary path? And it's quite possible that it is. I don't know that it's not. And, and you know, maybe, you know, artificial wombs and technology will solve the fertility problem, so to speak. Um, it's possible. I don't know that I want to live in that society, though. That's that wouldn't be my choice. Uh, I don't know that a centralized planning committee picking the genetic material for the next generation is really. I, I don't know. That that just seems too dystopian for me. So, Why? I think that going back to the old system of monogamy being the central element, I think has a lot more merit to me. Yeah, I think if you if you look at how close we've come. To this in the past with some people mention uh our mothering so when you have your own kids being taken care of by other people it's fairly rare in human society and in in mammals generally so it's not at all clear that we've got good reason based on life so far to expect this to be a raging success and you've said that one of the motivations for that kind of system would be that you share so much genetic material with the other offspring that you are caring for. Um, that would seem to be lacking in the kind of model that's being set up by hormonal contraceptives. Do you think that's the case? Yeah, it's, um, you know, one of the, one of the, I guess, outcomes of the birth control evolution has been a little before that, but has been a, a striking decrease in the, the fertility amongst Western civilizations in East Asia. So Japan and South Korea as well. Yeah. And China self-imposed, but they, I guess they kind of fit too. What ends up happening is that um, the structure that kind of builds that you social framework, you know, we do do some other uh, individual rearings of our children. Namely we have public school systems, right? Yeah. And we, we have a whole maturation process that's societally governed, we'll say. The parents are still primary, but it does exist. What ends up happening, though, is because the fertility dropped, you have to import children from, from I guess you'd say, fer fertile, healthy uh, societies out there. Yeah. The problem is, is that if there is any genetic component that, that kind of supports the hierarchy above it, when you swap that genetic component out, if it doesn't exist in the same way as it did in the original population, the hierarchy is going to eventually collapse. It's not going to be able to sustain itself because, again, it's an abstraction from the individual interactions amongst the constituent elements. So any yeah. of their behavioral patterns have to be aligned with it, yeah. which is why religion is so important for aligning all the behavior amongst the constituents. I mean, I'm a big fan of religion. I don't, I don't know that there's another way to do it. We haven't even talked about the, the, the death of God and how that plays into all this too, because it's, it's as big of a, an impact potentially as well. So I would say that we won't be able to perform this jump via immigration with an eye from external. We're going to have to find a stable fertility balance amongst the trade-off of the additional GDP boost from females working mm. and being a part of the economic system and the need to replenish the, the society with new children. There needs to be a balance and we're not there right now. We're in, we're in a bad spot. We need to get back over 2.1 at least. So, yeah, it, it seems on the face of it to, if not outright conflict with um, at least be in tension with some of the very fundamental primary maternal instincts on the female side. 
So most shared childcare would be in the extended nuclear family in the past, but now we've essentially got strangers looking after our own kids. And that's the model being set up. So just how satisfied women are likely to be by further moves in this direction, I think is a question that remains to be answered. It's interesting that the, the sexual revolution seems to be uh, viewed more negatively by women um, than by men, based on most of the surveys and studies. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not surprising when you think about it, but given that it was intended to liberate women, and yet they are the ones who seem to be regretting it the most, it's a curious fact. Yeah, there, there is no liberation when, when it's peaceful. So, and that's kind of the, the you know, if, 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 if there are any feminists in the audience or out there that think that the, the, the female revolution, especially the sexual revolution and the feminist like second wave specifically, um, were some sort of a actual revolution, there was not a single shot fired. Men gladly agreed to all the changes that were being proposed. Now, I would say that, you know, there's always going to be the holdouts, but on the, on the surface, the idea that we didn't have to uh, prove ourselves as, uh, as much as society used to mandate before gaining access to sexual reproduction, it's a win-win on the guy's books, short term, right? And that's why, for the most part, it was a peaceful revolution. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> that's, I don't think that women necessarily gained anything. I think they gave up a lot in that process. Hugely um, I, it comes yeah. back to what we said about the limiting factor in reproduction being the female and yeah. sex is a is a marketplace in a sense that responds to the normal laws of the marketplace, specifically law of supply and demand. And yeah. women were in a position of power by having sex in very high demand because men have a higher sex drive and it's in relatively low supply. And then suddenly when the, the pill comes along, contraception more broadly, it functions as a kind of shock or corrective to the market where the exchange price of sex comes all the way down again and it's just flooded and it's just so much easier for men to come by and that disempowers women ironically it does it, it imbalances the relationship which is unfortunate you know the there's it was a nuclear arms treaty so to speak originally in that you know society imposed fidelity on the females of our species in order to artificially increase the the we'll say hurdle to get over to gain sexual access as a male and in so doing you you know you carrot the males towards the goal of the society which is more production more sacrifice of their own individual wants and desires to produce things of value for the, the greater good so to speak um when the sexual revolution happened all you did was was kill the the internal female we'll say societal correcting mechanism by which they all kept each other in check to ensure that fidelity was amongst the males once they were sorted right because mm -hmm. the female hierarchy sorts the females to select a cross at approximately the same level as the male hierarchy creates the males when the sexual revolution happened all you did was kill that sorting mechanism and check mechanism and now hypergamy and polygamy are free to reign in the majority of society where the top percentage of men get access to a bunch of different women. And they basically rotate through them. And uh, the rest of men at the bottom suffer until their late 20s, early 30s, at which case they, there's an attempt to reintegrate when values start to align again. But it's not ideal. Yeah, and that ideal. explains why. Uh, one of the consequences of the pill is the the recent surge in the, the incel and men going their own way movements because it's as a consequence of rejection, essentially, because you're saying that once again, the, the top males are monopolizing the majority of females. Yeah, well, you know, I, I would say that that's just, look, the original monogamous system required sacrifice from the females and the top males. That's what it required. They had females on a, on whole had to choose on average less genetically worthy men to pair their lives with than they would have in the original system. And top males had to choose only one, right? Yeah. That's the sacrifice. But the the flip side of that is that the bottom, you know, 60, we'll say the middle 60% of males now all of a sudden are invested in this cooperative framework that we've set up. 
So they produce and that's where the engineers and the doctors and all the middle class, the broad middle class comes from without that, without that sacrifice on the other two's part, the broad middle class wouldn't exist. You'd have a top class that's dominant and tyrannical and a lower class that's poor and excluded from the reproductive access. And that, that would be the hierarchy, right? That just, we would resort back to the harem building yeah. that we came from. Um, I think that, I think that the men go their own way movement is a natural response to the unavailability what men would see as the unfairness or it's the breakdown of the old contract. If I'm a decent guy and I work my life to, to, to show that I'm worthy of this society, so to speak, then I should be able to find a female to create a family with, right? That's the old contract. Once that stops happening or that marriage becomes more dissolved than it used to be as far as a permanent pact, and you see that in the divorce rates, you just get the natural response from men, or especially that lower percentage, is going to be to say, I don't want to play anymore. I'm going to go and get on my social safety net monthly stipend, play video games in my mom's basement all the rest of my life because there's no reward for the sacrifice that I'm going to try to give here. So I, I love the way you put it in one of your videos, which is that without Andromeda, chain to the rock, Perseus flies on. Yeah, you have to call the hero forth. And I think that's, that's what's so, that was the, you know, in the videos I, I explored all of the myths that we have are kind of the hero myth. It's kind of the male model, right? We, 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 we mythologize the appropriate aspiration of the male, so to speak. And I kept asking myself, it's like, you know, there has to be a female counterpart to that. And, and the only one that we really had in the West was Mary, you know, the mother of Christ. She was kind of the, the central figure there, but I couldn't really figure out what, what the linkage is, right? Because Mary, in, 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 at least in, from, a, from a scriptural standpoint, she's the mother of God, you know, and she, she birthed the Savior, but it doesn't really talk about her behavior or what made her worthy to begin with, right? There's no map there. She just was. And so when exploring that, it comes back to the Andromeda and the hero. It's like, that's the, that's the role. If you as, and, and I named the channel actually after, after uh, a tale from Ovid's Metamorphosis about Cronus, who was so uh, virtuous and had so much fidelity and was so sought after that even Neptune wanted to pursue her, but she rejected him. So Neptune wasn't good enough. Even the God wasn't good enough for her. And that's kind of the ultimate aspiration. It's the mirror image of the hero. If the hero from the male standpoint is the one who's the most worthy, who's selected by all females, then the counterpart to that is the female that's so selective that only God is worthy of her, which is how you get married. Mm -hmm. Only God was worthy to sire her offspring, which gives you the savior. If you take those two things together, the ultimate from the male hierarchy, the ultimate the female hierarchy, that would birth the savior in, in essence. So, Well, one of the reasons for the, the choosy female is that women traditionally, in, well, biologically have to invest so much more in reproduction than men do and you can see that even in the the gametes so millions and millions of sperm relatively cheap and they can afford to be <laughs> expended um yeah eggs though precious finite relatively enormous and you've got to be careful with them but the pill seems to radically change the the risks involved in sex for women suddenly it becomes relatively cheap relatively easy at least physically Emotionally, I think there's some evidence to suggest that it's still a very precarious process and there's no such thing as like safe sex, judging by some of the, the comments that you see um, in surveys on women. But if you look at how many women are, are sexually active, the figures that I pulled up, 1950s, about 13% of teenage girls were sexually active. In the late 1990s, 47%. Before 1970, the average age of loss of virginity was 19 for women and about 18 for men. And then 1990s, 15 for both. Now, I think what you're seeing is that the attitude to sex among women is becoming more similar to what it was among men before the advent of the pill. Sex is just cheaper. It's easier. 
and it was supposed to be more pleasurable, but I'm not sure whether that really is true. The bond between the two sexes, the commitment, the family, and attraction as the main locus for that. If all that is weakened, then is the is the purpose of sex being changed, do you think? Well, I would say that, yes, I would say that it's being hijacked is the right way to, to put it. Um, even the sterile mole rats mount each other and engage in, in non-reproductive sexual behavior. Mm. Um, I, I would say that there's a bonding component to that to keep, and this, this sounds so maniacal, but you have to keep the population docile. And in order to do that, you have to keep them somewhat uh, entertained. And it goes back to the Roman idea of bread and circus. We'll extend that to the to the, the three primary drives, right? Security, food, and sex. Yeah. So you can, you know, the the biological systems, specifically the sex drive, it's not very it's it's highly evolved in a lot of ways, specifically about mate selection, but it's not evolved enough to know the difference between we'll say um, non-reproductive sexual encounters and reproductive sexual encounters. They're both the same. So you can satiate that drive, at least some part of it with sterile sexual encounters. And that helps to pacify the population and keep them motivated towards what you call the overall goal, which is what happens in the naked mole rats, right? The overall goal being the continuation of that hierarchical structure that puts a single female at the top, a couple yeah. of males near her, et cetera. We have a similar hierarchical structure. It's not one-to-one, -one, but it's the same kind of thing that we've laid on top. And uh, the goal is to keep that maintained at all costs. Mm -hmm. And the constituent elements could, could be interchanged out, but as long as the hierarchy remains the same, it would be okay, so to speak. Um, I would say that there are other components of our lower, repro our, our lower evolutionary functions that aren't satiated completely. And you see those manifest themselves in really dysfunctional ways in our population. And the, inf the infantilization of dogs, specifically by females in their 30s, is, is one of those ways. Um, and, and I can't help but think that that is the maternal instinct trying to load onto something else that it hasn't had the opportunity to load on, mm. right? So... There's also, you know, the crazy cat lady, you know, idea, which is another way to load that exact same nurturing, you know, need onto another animal. But um, those definitely aren't functional from an evolutionary standpoint, no matter how much you nurture a dog, even if you were to help it to breed and have puppies, that cycle can only last as long as you last. When you're gone, that entire process ends because you're not genetically similar to it. You're not going to pass anything on down the line. So yeah, that that's why the hormonal contraceptive is so mind blowing because the, the primary purpose of survival is reproduction. And we're just taking that out of the makeup of a fairly large proportion of females and waiting to see what happens. Um, you mentioned satiating through non, uh, non productive sexual encounters. It, it seems from the research that sexual pleasure for women is mainly tied to emotional connection. And right. it, it might not be the case that kind of flippant casual hookups uh, really satiate that. Perhaps men are more satiated by it, but you've also got the pill, meaning women are less receptive to traditionally masculine advances. And in fact, might tend to see it as more of a turn off than a turn on. So, men aren't really able to be satiated in that way. They're more likely to be accused of harassment or rape or something. And it seems that uh, porn is actually largely coming in to satiate the majority of men who aren't getting satisfied through the results of the sexual revolution. Do you think porn could be significant in that sense? It seems to be going up and up and up. If you look at the stats on how much the sheer volume of it is available online, we've never seen anything like that in human history before. And it's available to, to the, a younger and younger audience. Um, you know, I would say that there's no doubt that it, it's, it's the, the other side of that component, right? 
I would say that females are somewhat satiated by serial monogamy, even if it's sterile, serial monogamy. Um, whereas males are more satiated, it can be satiated just through straight polygamy, right? One night stands and whatever, yeah. to some degree, it's kind of empty, but they can at least get that part of their sex drive satiated. Yeah. Um, I, I would say as far as, and, and the, you know what, to be objective, maybe that's one of the ways that you solve the rising incel MG Tau, you know, I mean, go their own way stuff is that, you know, porn has probably put a, a lid on the amount of incels that are out there agitating against the system, because it does tend to quell that side of the population. And maybe it's a viable, you know, there aren't many comp countries moving to ban them that aren't highly religious. So I think deep down in our soul, we all know it's necessary for people to be out in the streets right now rioting, right? But I think that the right answer is to fix marriage and to get the system working again at, at its core element. And then those things somewhat become unnecessary because you have the, the proper hierarchical components built into your society. The idea of fixing marriage and returning to monogamy, though, is anathema to many feminists who see the main purpose of the pill contraception more broadly as liberating women from the prison of marriage and mm -hmm. women who fail to enjoy the results of the sexual revolution are seen as kind of traitors and it's more of an expectation than an option and if you don't take full advantage of it then you're letting the the side down do you are you holding out much hope for a return to monogamy in traditional family? Or do you think we're past that? Um, I am holding out a lot of hope. Uh, I think here's the, here's the positive news. The reproductive element of our society, this is the part of a society that actually has lots of children is highly religious and highly conservative when it comes to those kind of values. Um, and if you look at the populations that are growing, the Amish are growing rapidly. The Mormons are growing rapidly, um, and that might be it. But the, the conservative rural America, at least from an American standpoint, um, has a much higher fertility rate than the liberal, we'll say, urbanite, um, where you tend to see more feminism and whatnot happen. Now, there's some immigration from rural to urban but necessitated by the economic nature of our society. But as long as the maturation of new individuals primarily sits in conservative centers, right? And I don't mean conservative politically, I actually mean conservative from a societal hierarchy standpoint. There's always hope. The, 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 the truth of the outcome of all of this is that the people agitating for a new society and a new framework and the tearing down of monogamy and, and how it's in prison, they tend to not have children or have very little children. And because of that, it's it's a shorter term problem. There, there's, I guess I'd say there's hope that since they're not reproducing, as long as we can fix the ideas, the new generation coming up into them won't be uh, infected by them, so to speak. And that sounds terrible, but that's the best terminology I can come up with. Ideas can be infectious. So, Yeah. So ultimately, the answer to why you're hopeful is that the bad ideas can be dealt with intellectually. And meanwhile, the people propagating them can be outbred. Yeah, pretty much. I, I, and they are being, you know, one of the nice things about nature is that it doesn't really care who's objectively right about anything. All it as far as beliefs go, all it cares mm -hmm. about is which beliefs uh, incentivize behavior that's good for the individual elements. And that's something that Nietzsche wrote in one of his books. He's like, we don't really care about the objective truth of our ideas. We only care about how life-giving, life-preserving, or life-rearing those ideas make you be when you have them, right? So it doesn't really matter who's right as far as their analysis of history. All that matters is what behaviors are incentivized via you holding those beliefs. And if those beliefs lead you to not have children, not reproduce, not pass on those ideas, then they'll inevitably die out. If the beliefs incentivize you to do that and impel you to do that, then those ideas will flourish and continue on. And so from a long game perspective, I think we're, I, there's reason to be optimistic. Yeah, so some of the, uh, I won't drop any names, but some eminent scientists who claim that they've told their genes to go and 
jump in a lake by not having kids. You could easily see it the other way around. It's their genes telling them, uh, we don't want more of your kind around. We'd rather you didn't continue exactly. if you're not interested in continuing. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's, and that's one of those things that I, um, you know, nature self sorts that way. And, and when asked about abortion, I, I've started to give a different answer. I used to, you know, say, that I, you know, I'm not a big fan of abortion. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a complicated question, but, you know, in general, am I okay with it? No, I, I've started to give a different answer. And the answer is that if you choose as an individual to seed the future of this world to my genetic offspring without you having an impact with your genetic offspring, more power to you. If that's your self-selection out of the future gene pool. And, and that may be sound cold, but it's, it's kind of a stark view about what's actually happening. Um, and I've taken the, the stance that rather than placate the illusion and the delusion that the person who has those ideas holds, I'm just going to give them a reflection of stark reality about what's going to happen. It's like, you can make whatever decisions you want, but the inevitable outcome is that my kids will be there in the future and yours won't. So. Yeah. It's a powerful way to put it. Why do you think there aren't more studies on this topic? I mean, there are a few and the ones that there are are very telling in what they indicate might be happening, but it's one of the most interesting things about the 20th century, certainly. And you'd expect people to be flooding to it, to explore it. Yeah. You know, I, so we, we study the pill a lot from an individual perspective. So they know quite a bit about its side effects from yeah. blood clots to et cetera. Right. But the impact on society at large um, has really gone unstudied. There, I, when I did some research uh, in the, the peer reviewed libraries that I've access to through, the, through Arizona State, um, I pulled down everything I could find on studies about hormonal contraceptive and broader society. And what I found was that there's only about 12 of them that are worthy of any sort of reflection on that have interesting ideas in them. Um, and they generally relate to the breakdown of marriage, divorce rates, and uh, the collapse of marriage as an institution with the advent of the pill, which seems to predict that outcome. And, you know, even controlling for uh, poverty and access to water and everything else, the pill is the number one factor that predicts this breakdown of traditional gender roles, which is interesting. Um, I think that the reason that it's probably not studied more is that it's a sociological area of study primarily. And it tends to be that the people that go into sociology are ideologically opposed to, to that being a, a potential factor. So if you're not even open to the idea of the pill having negative consequences for society at large, you're not likely to, to, to study it in depth. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that I think has, has limited our knowledge of it. But from a systems perspective, you can stand back and just think about, you know, just flip the, the script. You can kind of see the, the massive impact. If I were to tell you that 13 to 30 year old men are going to start injecting testosterone daily in order to prevent their fertility. Would you predict that there would be an impact on the outcome of society just on a broad level? And the answer is duh. <laughs> like, how could it, how could it not? Like, so I think because women didn't, you know, become aggressive, roid ragey in the streets, you know, going crazy right off the bat. I think people just kind of sat back and said, Hey, there's nothing wrong here, but in reality, female, female impact is much more subtle and harder to detect a lot of times. Yeah. So certainly at least in the short term, yeah. although, uh, the factors you mentioned regarding correlation between the pill family breakdown, marital satisfaction, those seem to be revealing. Uh, it's scary listening to that because if what you're doing is fundamentally making men and women less attracted and attractive to each other then what do you expect to happen right yeah I, I you know on one of my videos i kind of put that up with a graphic showing that there's this nice interplay of the cycles between the hierarchies that kind of keeps them magnetically connected so to speak right and all we did was shift it off and weaken it and and then we sit back and go why is divorce going up why why are people's happiness going down you know Mm. Even when women were sh quote unquote shackled by marriage in the forties and fifties, they had a higher uh, self-reported happiness index than they do now when they're liberated and free. 
And those two things shouldn't really go together. I mean, not if, not if your theory is actually correct about it being shackling to be married. So, yeah, I think we are probably going to see in the coming decades, uh, more and more women making what is regarded as traditional choices because they find it more emotionally satisfying, but there might be some, some pushback from people who feel that they have betrayed the, the cause of, of liberation and just wanting to return to the prison they were supposed to be released from. Yeah, I think, and I think one of the things that, that uh, I'm going to extend an olive branch here, the feminist movement as a whole has a, had a lot of really good points. I, I think that similar to the atheist movement, and I, again, I'm not trying to offend anybody, when they ask intellectual questions like, why does X thing exist? There wasn't really a societal response to it that was articulatable right? It was the response to something like, well, it just needs to be that way. Or imagine what would happen if it didn't. And I think that's because that these systems are evolved systems that nobody really intellectually understood them mm. and, and why they were there. We just kind of knew they were important. You know, religion's important. Marriage is important. Fidelity is important, right? Since they asked the question about, you know, why should the woman be subservient to the man in the household? Stuff like that was asked. There was no good response. They probably correctly shrugged that off and said, if you can't articulate it to me, I don't really want to, you know, play that game anymore. The problem is there is not specifically that point, but there are good reasons why some of these systems evolved the way they did. And I think that while they can be changed to be better optimized, they shouldn't be thrown out altogether just because we don't understand something. It's like removing the spleen of the appendix because it doesn't matter. Well, come to find out they actually both do matter and you probably want to keep them both. You know, they're not there for no reason. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you made the great point earlier that monogamy is actually a, a compromise or trade off between both sexes. And it's a delicate symbiosis that life has arrived at in humans for good reason. And it might be the case that we're going to find out that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And uh, it'd be interesting to see. Very what much so. Very much so. I, I, I think that I think people are starting to wake up to the knowing that they've lost something important. Um, and you see that in the happiness indexes. Where have all the good men gone? Well, there's no Andromeda on the rock anymore. So why am I going to try to fight the sea monster? I'm just going to yeah. fly on, man. I, what, I asked you about reasons you might be hopeful. One of the things that gives me hope is that the systems that are being tampered with they're just so old and powerful i think that even the pill might not be powerful enough to do significant damage long term you with your data systems background might have more of an insight into that than i do but it would seem to take a lot and i would hope it would need a longer period of time than we've had so far since the 60s to really change things fundamentally but maybe these things are exponential and it will happen faster than we think. Well, I don't think humanity is going to go extinct. I don't see that. Um, the question is Western, whether Western civilization exists in the future, right? And the answer is I actually don't know. Um, and there are way more evolutionary dead ends in our history, of, in the history of life than there are current species on the planet. So the likelihood that will be an evolutionary dead end is very, very high from a strict probability perspective. Um, I would say that it's incumbent upon us. Here's what I would say, going back to Nietzsche's notion. If you believe that we are a dead end and we're doomed to failure, what kind of behavior is that gonna impel you towards? And is that behavior likely to bring about that outcome or to bring about a positive outcome? Versus if you're optimistic and you believe that there's a path forward and that we can make it through this, what kind of behaviors is that going to impel you towards? And is that going to lead to more positive outcomes or at least a higher chance of a positive outcome? So I choose to be optimistic for that sole purpose is that taking on that frame saying we can make it through this and the way to make it through this is everyone attempting to spread the truth, so to speak, in the best way possible. And in doing that, people can make informed decisions. And in doing that, society can continue to prosper. That kind of impels me down that path. 
pessimism is naturally, it robs you of your willpower and it robs you of your agency. And, uh, you know, it, it's not healthy and it, it actually is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, mm. yeah, I think that's a great message to end on. Uh, thanks so much for giving us a really great breakdown of this topic for people who haven't thought about it before. Some of the, uh, thoughts there are kind of earth shatteringly disturbing i think once they sink in but by the end there i think you've uh, given a reason to share the hope that you have yeah i appreciate that well uh, I, I think there is hope so i, I do want to end on a positive note i think that the hope comes through education so the more you share this message and the more people share these ideas and specifically this viewpoint i think the better chance we all have all right excellent where can fe people find out more about you Yep. So uh, I'm on YouTube, Cronius Focus on YouTube. Um, I also have, have a website, croniusfocus.com. Um, and they can always send an email. If they have any questions, I love correspondence, cronius.focus at gmail.com. So. All right. Thanks for that. Looking forward to seeing some more content from you soon. Thanks. Take Will. care. Thanks for coming on.